Okay, let's go ahead and resume. Uh, <clears throat> this talk uh, is going to focus on how in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses material gifts to convey spiritual gifts, specifically a material gift he makes use of throughout is the gift of water. And water becomes a means by which Jesus conveys grace to everyone he encounters. So to begin reflecting on this, we're going to examine one of the most deeply moving encounters with Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John, the meeting with the Samaritan woman. In chapter 4, I'll start here at verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, How can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you do not even have a bucket and the cistern is deep. Where then can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this cistern and drank from it himself with his children and his flocks? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And indeed, we find as we examine the Gospel of John that Jesus gives living water in many different ways, in many different contexts, as a means by which he can convey the blessings of eternal life that he wishes for his people to receive. So we're going to examine in this talk how he uses water to raise from natural to supernatural baptism, matrimony, and anointing of the sick. And we'll take them in that order. First, baptism. John the Baptist speaks early on of the baptism that Jesus will bring. John testified further. So this is in chapter 1, verse 32. I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from the sky and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So, John the Baptist is emphasizing that while his own baptism as John the Baptist was a symbolic washing indicating repentance for sins, that the baptism of Jesus Christ is a baptism of, in the Holy Spirit that actually deeply cleanses the soul. So John the Baptist is setting up this distinction early on in the Gospel of John. Moving ahead a little bit later, we see that baptism was an intrinsic part of the ministry of Jesus Christ early on. In chapter 3, verse 22, John reports, Jesus and his disciples went into the region of Judea, where he spent some time with them baptizing. And then there's this part where it almost seems semi-apologetic about Jesus' disciples and John the Baptist kind of working in the same territory. John was also baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was an abundance of water there and people came to be baptized, for John had not yet been imprisoned. Um, so, interestingly, early on, they actually had a bit of work to do to figure out how they were going to work together. But John the Baptist emphasizes what he brings is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, John also mentions in passing at the start of chapter 4, that Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. That is, Jesus had entrusted them with that particular ministry. Interestingly, in the teaching of the Catholic Church, baptism 
just as Jesus delegated his disciples to do it in that instance before their ordination, right? So before they received holy orders after his resurrection, so too any person with the intent to do what Jesus did can validly baptize. Um, it's not restricted to the clergy of the Catholic Church. Any of us can baptize if there's sufficient need for it to occur. For a lay person to baptize, that would typically be danger of death or what have you, but it's preferred that it be our clergy. But there it is. We can see even before his resurrection, he was instituting the sacrament. So, going back to chapter 3 for a moment, we have the famous conversation with Nicodemus. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you are doing unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. So, as it happens, in Greek, born again and born from above were the same phrase. And John here is emphasizing that Jesus is referring to birth from above, but Nicodemus is actually about to misunderstand him and be confused, which helps contextualize the next verse. Nicodemus said to him, how can a person once grown old be born again? Surely he cannot re-enter his mother's womb and be born again, can he? Uh, we're, we're so used to um, being reverent about scripture and such that it's easy to lose track of the fact that a line like that is uh, genuinely pretty funny. Uh, that he was so confused and mixed up in this way. You know, we just get into this mindset of, oh, it's holy, we have to be super serious. But, but there it is. I mean, it, it's really pretty hilarious. And there are other passages in the Gospels that are like this. So, verse 5. Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Well, this is a pretty challenging line, actually, what he's saying here. He's emphasizing the necessity of baptism. Right there. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Jesus is requesting that all who seek eternal life be baptized. Right there. In this day and age, it's not the most popular of teachings. And I hasten to emphasize that the church teaches that the sacraments are the ordinary means of salvation. God is not confined to them, and God in his own way can choose to save whoever he chooses to save, regardless of whether they've undergone baptism or not. Nevertheless, this is the path that Jesus wants everyone to follow, and each of us is asked to spread this news, that everyone should seek to be baptized. Uh, okay, where was I? Oh, there we go. Uh, what is born? Yeah, so I did that part. Do not be amazed that I told you, you must be born from above. <clears throat> the wind blows where it will, and you can hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So, here we have that same play on words we discussed earlier about breath and the Holy Spirit. The wind is again panuma, blowing where it wills. Panuma, spirit, panuma. The wind blowing where it wills is the Holy Spirit, right there. <clears throat> so water, infused with the Holy Spirit, brings about rebirth in the Holy Spirit. And this is what the church understands as baptismal regeneration. That is the cleansing effect of baptism in forgiving us of all sin. 
It is the means by which we join the Catholic Church and the kingdom of God following what Jesus commands right here. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. In the Gospel of Matthew is the Great Commission to baptize all nations. Right here, we see the emphasis on membership in the kingdom through the sacrament of baptism. So I mentioned earlier, baptism is not the only means by which Jesus uses water to convey grace in the Gospel of John. At the wedding of Cana, Water, too, becomes a blessing. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, do whatever he tells you. So here are a few reflections on the introduction to the wedding at Cana. On one level, one could see this passage as kind of trite and absurd. Uh, they ran out of wine. Whatever, right? No big deal. This is a miracle working occasion. Find me a blind man or somebody who needs to be resurrected or something. But it causes us to think about, what is a wedding? Why does it matter? And why do we invite guests? See, the purpose of a wedding is to publicly pronounce the vows of lifelong fidelity to the other. That's its purpose. It needs to be public because... The couple needs to be held accountable for those vows. See, you know, I, I can look back at my own wedding nearly 20 years ago at this point, And it was a wonderful day. And uh, we had, you know, over 100 family and friends there. People traveled in from various parts of the country and the like. And, and we had a very beautiful wedding in a beautiful Catholic church, and we had a wonderful reception afterward. It was just a very nice day. But ultimately, the reason for bringing my friends and family together on that day was to, by saying our vows in their presence, invite them to hold my wife and I accountable to those vows. By publicly saying the vows... There's no backing out. There's no, there's no um, escape hatch, so to speak. If I'm not behaving in accordance with those vows, by inviting these people to my wedding, I'm saying, you hold me accountable. You tell me if I'm straying from the course. And whenever we attend a wedding, by virtue of being invited, we are invited to hold the couple accountable for their vows. I don't think this is the way the wedding industry typically talks about it. But when you really think deeply about it, that's exactly what's happening. It follows then that if you're going to invite these guests for this occasion with this grave purpose of holding us accountable, you have an obligation to be hospitable for them. Especially in the context of the time, travel was more difficult and the like. Um, you owed them hospitality. And serving wine was an intrinsic part of that hospitality. Intrinsic to the culture. So to run out of wine was an indescribably severe faux pas. It meant you invited all these people, they're holding you accountable, and to some degree, you've already blown it. So it's not just a matter of social embarrassment or any such thing. It's a matter of a sense in which the couple was about to be seen as not doing their part. We've really lost that idea in this culture that 
you know, in this culture, we're so atomized and separated and everything. We've lost a strong sense of how we all need to be there for each other and help bring each other to God and hold each other accountable when we fall astray. But they were very aware of it. So what happens is the Blessed Virgin Mary intercedes with Jesus. And then she says, do whatever he tells you. So let's look at this part next. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one, but you have kept the good wine until now. A couple things I want to point out. <clears throat> Think about what it means to have a stone water jar that holds 20 to 30 gallons. If I'm having a bad morning, getting a one-gallon jug out of the milk, a one-gallon jug of milk out of the refrigerator can be kind of annoying, right? I mean, it's actually fairly heavy. And when you think about 20 to 30 gallons in stone jars, what we see from this is that these servants were undertaking a significant amount of physical labor following this random instruction from Jesus. They had no basis whatsoever for believing that going and filling these things with jars of water was somehow going to solve the problem. But how do they respond? When they're called by Jesus to do something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to them, they respond by filling them to the brim. They respond with enthusiasm. There's no hesitation. They go, they fill it to the brim all the way up, and we know water is heavy, and then they haul it back. And see, it's in part because of the extraordinary effort and enthusiasm they put to the task that Jesus is able to make the ordinary extraordinary. He's able to make ordinary water extraordinary wine. Just like that. But for that to happen, they had to follow his command and fill the stone jars with water. They had to make a leap of faith in that moment that Jesus was going to take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. This symbolizes the fact that Jesus transforms marriage from a natural to a supernatural institution. In the tradition of the church, the wedding of Cana is a pivotal moment in matrimony. Jesus, by his presence at the wedding and by his miracle at the wedding, emphasizes the supernatural character of what we're called to do in marriage. The raising of children as well goes from a natural to a supernatural responsibility. You know, in the Catholic Church, we all baptize our children, you know? And when we baptize our children, again, it's not just kind of a simple social event. It's a moment in which we take responsibility for ensuring that those children are brought up in a relationship with God. The natural becomes the supernatural. Marriage can be challenging from time to time. Everyone who's been married for a while has no doubt encountered some challenges. But in those challenges... We're called to just love all the more deeply. And to this end, I want to invite you to look at chapter 19, verse 33 and 34. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. So this is the depth of love we're actually called to in marriage. Thinking of it on our own power, it may appear impossible. On our own power, 
It actually kind of is. But with the supernatural grace that Jesus Christ gives us, just as he raised the water into wine, he raises every little thing we bring to the marriage in a supernatural way. Just as the servants had to bring through laborious effort six stone jars filled with 20 gallons of water, whenever we're willing to put in the laborious effort for our marriages, Jesus turns them from water into wine. A cause for celebration and for life. The Eucharist connects the wedding at Cana to the crucifixion. It has long been the tradition of the church to see the blood and water flowing out of the side of the crucified Jesus as the blood of Christ that we imbibe for our salvation. It is an intrinsically Eucharistic passage. And so too, Catholic weddings are rightly and properly celebrated alongside the Eucharist. The newly married couple takes the Eucharist together because they are bringing to their marriage, they are bringing each other to the foot of the cross to bring into their marriage every blessing that the foot of the cross makes possible. Anointing of the sick. So, according to the catechism, anointing of the sick is a sacrament to be received by a member of the faithful in danger of death from illness or old age. It can be received many times as long as that danger persists. And obviously after a certain age, it would appear you can receive it fairly frequently. Uh, but as long as that persists, we can receive the sacrament. So what's the effect of the sacrament? I included those for you here. Strengthening peace and courage to overcome the difficulties that go with the condition of serious illness or the frailty of old age. This grace is a gift of the Holy Spirit who renews trust and faith in God and strengthens against the temptations of the evil one, the temptation to discouragement and anguish in the face of death. All of us at some point, no doubt, have had the opportunity to journey with a loved one as they confront the ultimate end of their life on earth. And those of us that have gone on that walk, no doubt, have seen this temptation. This temptation to discouragement and anguish. The importance of the sacrament of anointing of the sick and strengthening the soul against this discouragement cannot be overstated. Cannot be overstated. My grandmother was dying. She was in a nursing home in Florida. I was living in Virginia at the time. It was clear that the end was near. And she had, after many decades of absence, she had returned to the sacraments thanks to the ministry of persons who came to bring the sacraments to the nursing home where she was living. This happened in 2002, so in my last semester of graduate school. And so I called, I got on the phone, I called that parish, and I said, my grandmother is dying, it's time for her to receive the anointing of the sick. Do what you must do to make this happen. She never really regained consciousness, but she did receive the anointing of the sick. Now I'm going to tell you an amazing story. One morning, my son said, Dad, is purgatory like a ladder? I'm like, yeah, Thomas, it's, 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 you can think of it that way. I didn't add it, but you know, Dante said that, right, in Purgatorio. Yeah. You know, for my then six or seven year old son, that wasn't deeply meaningful. And he said, well, I had this dream. I had this dream in which a woman who said she was your grandmother was in purgatory and that it was like climbing a ladder. And I said, 
That, that sounds about right. We need to pray for her soul. She's in purgatory. But what a deep consolation. What a deep consolation indeed to know that ultimately she was on the ladder that was going to lead to being in the Lord's bosom. The sacrament then forgives venial sin and it can also forgive mortal sin if the recipient is unable to make a confession. Very powerful sacrament indeed. To explore the sacrament further, we're going to study the story of the healing of the blind man. And so this starts at chapter 9 and teaches us a lot about the sacrament. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. Whoa. What Jesus is combating here is an inaccurate idea about God. And as we read the Bible throughout, we can see many occurrences of this bad idea, but we also see many refutations of this bad idea. What do we mean by this? The book of Job, in which a righteous man undergoes tremendous suffering at the hands of the devil, emphasizes the disconnection between whether we suffer on earth, that being an evidence of sin. They had that, and so for them to bring up this point of view is already erroneous. But Jesus Christ, for the sake of their souls, makes it as clear as possible. It is so the works of God might be made visible through him. And this is an idea... <coughs> this is an idea we can carry forward with us into any experience of suffering or illness. We can always ask God the question in prayer. Lord, and it's always good to be honest with God. Lord, this illness stinks. But how might your works be made visible through it? Or even better, what do you call me to do such that your works may be made visible through it? We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Part of what's going on here is that Jesus uses miraculous healings to be, to illustrate how he is the light of the world and how he is bringing salvation to the world. And these healings, these miracles are evidence of it. <clears throat> they still happen, not terribly often, but as God sees fit, certainly miraculous healings do occur. We can't cause them. We can ask for them, but we can't cause them as such. But for the most part, it's darkness. For the most part, our experiences of illness is that they have to be treated by ordinary medical means. In that sense, there is darkness in the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and smeared the clay on his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back able to see. Jesus uses water to bring about a miracle. Water to bring about spiritual healing. <clears throat> We're going to fast forward a bit to verse 35. I fast forwarded one page too many. Just a second. Uh, okay, more than one page too many. Oh, here we go. Okay, verse 35. So, uh, the man had been healed. He had been thrown out of the synagogue for associating with Jesus. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshipped him. Then Jesus said, 
I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see might see and those who do see might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, surely we are not also blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you are saying, we see, so your sin remains. Ouch. Physical illness, then, is a sign of spiritual illness, but it is not itself identical with the spiritual illness. Through healing this physical illness, Jesus makes clear he will also heal spiritual illness. But you have to want it. You have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge, I have a spiritual illness and I need the divine physician. He won't make you do it. You have to do your part. The man who was blind and could now see, we now observe in this passage, was also able to see spiritually. Not because of the miracle, but the miracle nurtured a faith that then allowed him to freely accept the invitation being given by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> a true irony here is how these Pharisees were aware that the miracle had happened. And they responded to the miracle, not by saying, wow, time to change my life. Instead, it was just like, oh, you're miraculously healed. Well, you're dealing with this nutcase. Forget it. Get out of here. It's like not even taking a moment to pause at the fact that the work of God was there in their midst and it just blew past them. Why? Because they were spiritually blind. They get an actual healing in front of them and they move on because they're spiritually blind. One who does not repent is spiritually blind. The blind man does as Jesus instructs, washing the mud out of his eyes. And following the instructions of Jesus, he gets both physical and spiritual clarity. The Pharisees do not follow Jesus, and their blindness remains. Throughout the Gospel of John, and beyond the examples I've just shown you, Jesus uses water to make natural things supernatural. Through all seven of the sacraments, the Catholic Church, given her ministry by Jesus Christ, makes natural things supernatural. Out of the ordinary, we get the extraordinary. So we're going to take another uh, break for reflection and standing up, what have you. Um, priests are still here if you want to make a confession. Uh, I will begin the final talk uh, promptly at 2.30. So enjoy the time for reflection, and I'll, we'll be right back here in uh, about 25 minutes.